Hey, Snackers, this is Kareem Iskander. Hey, everyone, Matt Dinapoli here. Welcome to episode 159 of Snackbound. Kareem, do you remember last year when we were doing uh, cybersecurity months and I always said that they were spooky? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Spooky. Yes, we should do that again. Well, a, related. we're in October and this is a cybersecurity topic. And so it is a spooky <laughs> <laughs> cybersecurity uh, um, month. Uh, of October, where we have Kyle joining us again. Uh, he actually talked to us last month about security as well. Um, it wasn't as spooky then because it was just September. But um, Kyle talked about red and blue teams, and and today he's actually joining us to talk about purple teams. And so, Kyle, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself first, and then we'll jump into purple teams and what that all means. Yeah, my name is Kyle Winters. I am a technical advocate on the learning and certifications team based out of Irvine, California. And I take a focus on security. Okay, what are you going to talk to us about today? So I want to talk today about purple teaming, what it is, how you can get started in building a purple team, and what are some of the challenges and pitfalls that might arise as you're building a purple team. Well, let's start with the obvious question first. What is a what is what is purple teaming, and how does it differ from red and blue team in cybersecurity? Of course, because that's spooky. So purple teaming has roots in military vernacular, where Red versus blue, red typically represented the enemy, and blue was the defensive side. This model was then brought into cybersecurity where red teams simulate attacks and blue teams would defend against them. But for a long time, these teams worked separately, which often led to communication gaps and missed chances to improve overall security. I want to share a quote from The Art of War by Sun Tzu. If you know your, if you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. If you know yourself but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you will also suffer a defeat. If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. This quote really gets at the heart of what purple teaming is. It's about flipping that red versus blue team model and encouraging collaboration instead of keeping these teams separate. When these teams join forces, they gain a better understanding of the attacker's playbooks and the organization's defenses. So it's all about knowing how the enemy thinks and how to counter their moves. Instead of operating in isolation and in silos, purple teaming is really about encouraging these two teams to work together. Okay, talk to us a little bit about that cultural shift um, into, you know, kind of bridging the gap between blue and red, making them a little bit purple. How can an organization actually train about train their their teams on the skill sets and um, develop a more cybersecurity staff that's on the purple side. So it's really about aligning on goals and first understanding that there's an obvious common goal here between red and blue typically, which is to strengthen the organization's security posture. By having red teams simulate attacks and then immediately sharing how they did it, the blue team can improve defenses right on the spot. This continuous feedback loop really helps identify vulnerabilities faster and patch them before they can be exploited in the real world. There's also a big factor about improving communication between your traditional red and blue teams. You know, when these teams work separately, important insights can get lost. So purple teaming encourages collaboration so that both teams are always on the same page and sharing information in real time. Another big part of it as well is just fostering that culture of continuous learning. Cyber threats are constantly evolving today, and both teams need to stay sharp and adapt their strategies. When you do purple teaming, it ensures that both red and blue teams are always learning from each other, testing new tactics, and improving their skills, which ultimately makes your organization more resilient as a whole to future threats. Are there any specific skills um, that you would recommend for uh, for people that are looking to build out a, a, a purple team or the members of a purple team to have? Yeah, so its members need to bring a blend of both offensive and defensive skills. The traditional red team side of things who are doing the offensive stuff should have a strong penetration testing background, knowing how to simulate attacks, exploit vulnerabilities, and test the overall resilience of an organization's defenses understanding the attack kill chain and how to implement different steps across it from reconnaissance all the way to things like command and control and exfiltration are critical keys. On the more defensive side of things, on the other hand, uh, team members should have a solid background in things like incident response, knowing how to detect, analyze, and respond to threats as they arise. 
They should be familiar with tools like SIMS, such as Splunk and incident response platforms, things like XDR that help them monitor and defend against attack attacks in real time. Beyond just technical skills though, communication and teamwork are just as important. Purple teams really rely on that continuous collaboration between the red and the blue side of things. So being able to share insights and work together effectively is pretty key. Team members really need to be able to explain their findings clearly and work alongside their counterparts to improve uh, their overall posture as they go through these different types of exercises. So it's really that mix of offensive skills, defensive skills, and the soft skills that make Purple Team successful. That makes a lot of sense. So I know, Kyle, based on what you just said, I know you uh, put together a set of tutorials to basically help um, teams come together and become more purple. I know we have training out there with our um, ethical hacking um, training as well as the certificate that we released. Um, but I'd like you to to talk a little bit about what you've done, what you have on Cisco U for our snackers to basically get their hands um, dirty with the whole concept of and, and cultural shift of purple teaming. Yeah, so going back to that quote from The Art of War, I think it's very valuable for people on both the offensive and defensive side to really understand the other side of the picture that just makes you a lot more strong as a contributor in this type of model. So on Cisco U and Net Academy, we have a lot of resources available for people to skill up, not just on the defensive side where Cisco traditionally focuses, but also on the offensive side of things as well, too. Some examples on the defensive side include lots of learning pads focused on things like cyber operations uh, that will gear you towards our cyber ops cert certifications that will really teach you how to operate in a security operations center and be able to detect and mitigate threats. On the offensive side, though, we are introducing a certificate in ethical hacking, and you can complete this course through NetAcad. And essentially, once you complete that, you get a certificate of completion. And you're also able to participate in capture the flag challenges that we're introducing on Cisco U as well. And we're going to be introducing new challenges about every nine weeks or so. And this is going to be a great way to get hands on and learn how to actually do some of this red teaming and blue teaming type activities in a simulated lab environment. We also are releasing for Cybersecurity Month some free tutorials that are available on Cisco U that you can check out. One of them is on network reconnaissance using Nmap. And another one, which if you guys have time, I would love to show you today, is how to do ARP spoofing and initiate man in the middle attacks. I was hoping to see something cool. Yeah, so if you're not familiar, ARP spoofing is a type of man in the middle attack. It's basically an exploit that a malicious actor on a local network would use to intercept and grab data. If the ARP protocol on its own relies on trust, meaning there's no built-in way to check if info being passed around is legitimate or fake. So ultimately, these you can have a device that is sending out ARP packets without being asked. It's called gratuitous ARP. And other devices on the network will just accept this info without questioning it. So this attack that I'm going to show you today works by fooling one of the devices into sending IP packets to a device set up by the attacker, which then captures and routes that traffic back to its original destination and vice versa in both directions. So this is commonly called a man in the middle attack. And the device that I'm going to show you here today, it's just a Linux server, uh, but it's going to essentially serve as another hop along the way for that packet where we can intercept the communications and be able to read that in. So. Let me go ahead and start by showing you a couple of the servers that I have here inside of Cisco Modeling Labs. And for those who are watching along as well, like I said, you can access this on Cisco U and be able to follow along with this as well too. And we'll drop the link snackers for you. So you can see here, we have this Linux server, man in the middle dash Alpine and take note really quick of not just its IP address here, but also its MAC address. So you can see the MAC address here, just take note that it ends in CDF1. We also have uh, another router here that's set up uh, with the IP 172.16.1-1.5. There's also a gateway here that is a .1 address. And we're also gonna initiate communication from the router via Telnet eventually later on down the road to this server that's operating outside of this LAN. So, to start, let me just show you really quick 
the ARC table that currently exists on these devices. You can see the IP addresses here as well as the MAC addresses there. And let's take a look really quick at the Gateway one as well. You can see uh, kind of a standard ARC table, what you'd expect. Uh, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to jump back over here. I'm gonna initiate the man in the middle attack and I'm gonna use a tool called EdderCap. So I'm gonna run this command, sudo EdderCap-T-I, get at the interface. Dash M ARP remote. And I'm going to give it the IP address of the two hosts. And what this is going to do is this is going to broadcast out an ARP message to these hosts saying that the, the MAC address of this Linux host that I'm on now is going to replace the MAC address of these two hosts that I'm populating in here. So I'm going to go ahead and run that. You can see that's running now. And if we jump back over to the ARP tables and I run this again, you'll see that there has been a change here. So where this one before 1.1 1 .1, had 4F20, now it's CDF1, which is the MAC address of the Linux man in the middle post that I'm using. <laughs> if we jump back over to the gateway and do the same thing, you can see it's also replaced it here as well too. One, uh, the dot five host, which is the router that I was just on, now showing the MAC address of that Linux host. So what I can do now, if I go back, let's say to this router here, I'm just gonna initiate a telnet to that remote host, that server that I showed you a little bit ago, 192.168.0.100. And let's just go ahead and log in, Cisco, Cisco. I logged in successfully, but if we jump over here, you'll see that that communication was actually captured by the man of the middle host. And if we scroll up just a little bit here, you'll see that the input coming in through that connection was captured by this man of the middle host. You can see the password here and each character is captured on its own line. So I entered that password as Cisco and you can see here each character C, I, oh, interesting. S, D, O. <laughs> I just grabbed that password super easily. So. This is a, a, an easy attack for people to implement if the proper security measures aren't put in place. And typically by default, these security measures are not in place. So if you take the free Cisco U tutorial, you'll learn not only how to do this attack, but also how to set up proper defenses against this type of attack as well, too. That's cool. That is really cool. <laughs> spooky. <laughs> it's spooky. I just got a <laughs> chill done. I spine. <laughs> Kyle, unfortunately, that's um, all the time we have today. Um, before we wrap up, um, I, I mean, you mentioned all of the, the great materials on Cisco U and, um, you know, any, any last thoughts before we let you go? No, I mean, definitely check out the free content that's available on Cisco U. Um, I encourage everybody to, you know, that's security focused to learn a little bit of offensive security as well. It's going to help you be stronger in your role and be more resilient as an organization. So definitely check out that as well as the certificate in ethical hacking. And I encourage you all to, to take it and make yourself a little bit more purple. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Kyle. Kyle, it's a pleasure to have you on and, uh, snackers, uh, thank you for your time and stick around for next week's episode.